Coming up on today's Airborne, Dragon experiences a glitch but still docks successfully with the ISS. Boeing's Dreamliner fix offers layers of protection. And Gamera 2 is still striding toward the Sikorsky Prize for human-powered flight. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. In the old days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, NASA's astronauts expected and waited for something to go wrong, a glitch and it seemed every mission had one. Now as we move to commercial space exploration, some things seem to stay the same. After a perfect launch aboard a Falcon 9 rocket Friday morning, the SpaceX Dragon supply capsule carrying stores and experiments to the ISS hit a glitch. The spacecraft reached orbit on time at 1010 Eastern Time Friday. But a problem with the capsule's thruster pods delayed the deployment of the spacecraft's solar arrays. Fortunately, the problem was short-lived. Less than two hours later, SpaceX confirmed that the solar arrays had deployed. After controllers on the ground completed an override of the spacecraft's onboard computers. From there, the Dragon continued on to the International Space Station and completed a successful docking early Sunday. Dragon is carrying about 2,300 pounds of cargo, including scientific experiments, computers, and an air recycling system. Boeing officials say the battery solution they've put in place for the 787 Dreamliner offers three levels of protection. Tom Patton has that story. FAA Administrator Michael Huerta said the proposed solution, quote, looks to be very comprehensive. But he still cannot speculate as to when the long-awaited airliners will be flying again. In testimony before the House Transportation Aviation Subcommittee this past week, Huerta told the committee that the solution proposed by Boeing would first try to prevent the individual cells of the batteries from overheating. Should there be an overheating issue, the second layer is designed to keep that or any cell from causing a thermal runaway. Finally, the solution would prevent damage to an airplane should there be a complete battery failure. However, Huerta reasserted that the public safety is the agency's top priority and they will not allow the 787 to return to service, quote, until we're confident that any proposed solution has addressed the battery failure risks, end quote. The actual cause of the battery fire has not been determined. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. The Gamera 2 team from the University of Maryland's Clark School of Engineering made several attempts this week to meet the requirements of the Sikorsky Prize, but were unable to reach more than six feet of altitude in the latest iteration of the human-powered quadcopter, the Gamera 2 XR. The latest attempt was made at the Baltimore Convention Center with judges from the NAA and the American Helicopter Society International looking on, this according to a report in the Baltimore Sun. But they stopped after dozens of unsuccessful attempts. The highest altitude they were able to reach was about six feet off the convention center floor. But while the Sikorsky Prize remains unclaimed, pilot Colin Gore told the paper flying the Gamera 2's XR is, quote, one of the most thrilling things I've done in my life. More people have walked on the moon than have flown in a human-powered helicopter, end quote. To win the Sikorsky Prize, a human-powered helicopter must reach an altitude of 10 feet for at least one minute and stay within a 10 by 10 meter box demonstrating controllability. In August, the Camara 2 team flew for 65 seconds, but came a few inches short of the 10 feet required to win the prize. The effort set a world record for flight duration by a human-powered helicopter, but fell just short of the prize. Diamond Aircraft has sent a letter to its customers to reassure them that the company will meet its ongoing commitments despite beginning to restructure its Canadian division. The letter from CEO Peter Moore said that while the company has made, quote, significant reductions to our workforce, end quote, that many of those cuts have come from the DJET program. We have retained the personnel required to continue our operations, Moore said. Those operations include production and delivery of the DA-20, DA-40, and DA-42 piston aircraft, production of support parts for all models, 
customer support, technical services, and continuing airworthiness support, warranty and premium care services, maintenance training, on-site customer support services, and new aircraft sales. Moore's letter went on to say that the only real effect the restructuring should have on customers is possibly longer than usual delivery times for new aircraft. It didn't take long for the first effects of the sequester to become known. ANN received this statement from the Air Force that reads in part, quote, Effective immediately, active duty reserve and guard units will seize all aviation support to the public. This includes the cancellation of support to all air shows, trade shows, flyovers, including funerals and military graduations, orientation flights, heritage flights, F-22 demonstration flights, and open houses, unless the event includes only local static assets. Additionally, the Air Force will cancel the Thunderbirds' entire 2013 season beginning April 1st, end quote. Standing down, the Thunderbirds will save flying hours to help meet other readiness needs. The Air Force will reduce flying hours by as much as 18 percent, approximately 203,000 hours. And impacts will be felt across the service and directly affect operational and training missions. Brigadier General Les Conlick, Director of Air Force Public Affairs, said, quote, Engaging with the public is a core Air Force mission, and communicating and connecting with the public is more important today than ever before. However, faced with deep budget cuts, we have no choice but to stop public aviation support, end quote. The general added, the Air Force will continue to seek additional ways to remain engaged with the American public. You're watching Airborne. More when we come back in just a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. We're using technology to make this kind of training accessible to all flight schools of all sizes and all budgets. And to democratize flying in general because we make this kind of training more accessible to people. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop us an email to news-by at aero-news.net. Legislation requiring the FAA to set guidelines on flight paths and minimum altitudes used by helicopter operators in residential areas of Los Angeles County, California, has been reintroduced in both the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate. Sponsored by Representative Adam Schiff and Senators Dianne Feinstein and Barbara Boxer, the Los Angeles Residential Helicopter Noise Relief Act would require the FAA to exempt from their requirements helicopter operations related to emergency, law enforcement, or military activities. Residents and community groups in Los Angeles County have complained for years to local authorities about helicopter noise. FAA representatives have held several meetings since last summer with the general public, area homeowners, helicopter users, and other interested parties to get feedback on the issues. An FAA report recommending possible remedies to the noise situation in the Los Angeles Basin is due out in May. Controlling helicopter noise in Los Angeles by imposing traffic corridors or altitude restrictions could backfire, as they did in 2007 in Long Island, New York, when such changes resulted in three times the number of complaints because flights became concentrated over a smaller area on their way to and from the planned routes. 
The Allied Pilots Association continues to voice strong support for raising qualification requirements for first officers who fly for U.S. passenger and cargo airlines. The Airline Safety and Federal Aviation Administration Extension Act of 2010 would require first officers, also known as co-pilots, to hold an airline transport pilot certificate, requiring 1,500 hours of total pilot flight time comprised of a variety of flight conditions, as well as an aircraft type rating, which requires additional training specific to the airplanes they fly. Currently, first officers are required to have only a commercial pilot certificate, which requires 250 hours of flight time. APA President Keith Wilson said that a recent in-flight emergency aboard an Alaska Airlines flight clearly demonstrated the need for highly trained first officers. Wilson said, quote, Just last month, when the captain of Alaska Airlines Flight 473 suffered a medical emergency, the co-pilot was left alone to safely land the airplane. Emergencies happen and people can become incapacitated. That's exactly why you need equally qualified pilots in the cockpit, end quote. Well, we began today's program talking about the good old days of manned spaceflight. So what better time to enjoy today's Aero Video of the Week? It's a trip back in time to the Apollo 16 mission, when astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke took the lunar rover out for a spin. In a film clip, NASA calls the Apollo 16 Lunar Rover Grand Prix. You'll find it by searching YouTube for the same title. Call it the Aerial Polar Express. Retired American Captain Bill Harrelson is planning a circumpolar record attempt in March or October of this year. His flight plan departs Bangor, Massachusetts, Recife, Brazil, Punta Arena, Chile, over the South Pole to New Zealand, on to Honolulu, then to Fairbanks, and back to Bangor. Bill plans to do the legs back to back with minimal in route time at his stops, shattering the old record. Harrelson hopes to accomplish this feat in a home-built Lance Air 4 that took eight years of build time, having been completed just last year. This past weekend, Harrelson took the plane out for a test flight, a simple little 7,000-mile jaunt from Guam to Jacksonville, Florida. He hopes this will set a distance record for a single-engine land in its weight class. Harrelson and his wife Sue are no strangers to long-distance endurance flying, having built and then flown a Lance Air 320 to Europe. The couple have completed three home-built aircraft. Well, that's our program for Tuesday, March 5th. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please join us again this Friday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.